Hey everyone, it's Corey McCarthy and welcome to a new episode. So, my last video stirred up a number of comments that I felt I should address regarding soy foods. They included the statements that soy promotes cancer and tumor growth by raising IGF-1 levels, and that it stimulates the growth of breast cancer cells, and that soy also reduces fertility. I've heard all of this before, as long-term viewers of this channel should know by now. The last guy even linked three papers to support his claim that soy stimulates the growth of estrogen-dependent breast cancer cells. But, unfortunately for his argument, all three papers that he referenced were from single studies that only examined the rodent model. I've mentioned time and again that conclusions drawn from animal model research aren't necessarily conclusive for human beings. For example, research has found that in the non-human animal model, the herb Tribulus terrestris significantly raises serum testosterone values. However, this is not the case in human studies. For another example, humans can enjoy foods like avocado, chocolate, coffee, grapes, etc., but these foods are toxic to many animals according to the ASPCA. So, I repeat, the findings from animal model studies are not necessarily conclusive among human beings. We have differing biologies, but hey, don't just take it from me, a Mr. Joe YouTuber. Even the American Cancer Society has specifically stated in May 2015 that human studies and animal studies differ in results when it comes to soy foods. In fact, they stated that in human studies, soy seems to either reduce breast cancer risk or have no effect at all. They also stated that no reliable studies have pointed to any dangers from eating soy, and the health benefits even appear to outweigh any potential risk. Now, obviously, if you have allergies to soy or your doctor, I specifically advise that you personally not consume soy, then don't. But let's not overgeneralize here for everyone and stir up fear-mongering. This guy also linked a Mercola article, void of any references, and some random guy's YouTube video, which was also void of references. First of all, Mercola isn't a reliable source for information. No more than a witch doctor is a reliable source for treating illnesses. In fact, the FDA has issued him numerous warnings regarding the many illegal claims that he's made. And I repeat, Mercola's article on soy had no references, which was really no shock, to be perfectly honest. He could have been pulling the data out of his ass for all that I know, or from hearsay, or from poorly conducted one-off research. By this point, I will admit I didn't even bother watching the final linked video, which, as I said, also didn't have any references for viewers to directly review. Four out of the five references this guy provided to support his arguments were simply not substantial enough to actually support his case. So I saw no point in wasting any more time on the fifth. Now, as for soy raising estrogen or lowering testosterone or lowering fertility in men, Two peer-reviewed meta-analysis covering over 51 human male study groups, I repeat that, human study groups, including placebo control groups, found that soy protein and isoflavone intake had no significant effects on testosterone, sex hormone binding globulin, free testosterone, or free androgen index, regardless of statistical model. Furthermore, soy was not found to exert feminizing effects on men at intake levels equal to and even considerably higher than what is typical for Asian males. And I reiterate, those were meta-analysis, not a single study, but rather a review of the data from a broad body of research. Now, despite having gone over this matter time and time again on this channel, people still believe the popular myths about soy. At this point, I've said all I can in the matter, and people will buy into whatever bullshit or brainwashing they want. If you don't want to eat soy, more power to you. Me, I will keep enjoying soy. I have no allergies to soy. It is incredibly flexible taste-wise, and it fits my macros well. Furthermore, it has a perfect protein digestibility corrected amino acid score of 1, which ranks it higher than red meat. Ultimately, I don't really care if people make a personal choice to av avoid a specific food, uh, regardless of their reasoning. It's their bodies, after all, but I do take issue with the spread of misinformation. Anyhow, with that out of the way, I wanted to tackle one final issue in detail about soy raising IGF-1 and thus raising the uh, risk of cancer or tumor growth. To do this, I will play a clip from an older video of mine and allow the me of August 2015 to explain in great depth. In this clip, I will be discussing protein's effect on mTOR and IGF-1. Uh, the principles obviously apply to soy. Soy is very high in the essential amino acid leucine. Anyhow, take it away, me.
Protein as a nitrogenous compound contains BCAAs, which are three of the nine essential amino acids known collectively as branch chain amino acids. They include leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Uh, they are all essential in that your body must obtain them from diet. Um, leucine is the real culpr sorry, culprit here uh, for Richard's claims. So why is that? Leucine has been shown to regulate mTOR, or the mammalian target of rapamycin. And mTOR has been shown to promote cell growth and thus tumor cell motility and subsequently the spread of cancer. But what people need to understand is the difference between a transient and a longer lasting effect. While leucine may increase mTOR activity, the effect is transient when it comes to diet. In other words, it would spike during and after the meal but decline as time passes from the meal. Even hypertrophy-induced weight training can raise mTOR, but again, it is a transient effect. Much like the positive effects on testosterone and growth hormone from weight training. Which, as demonstrated in research, are both spiked, but declined to baseline within 30 minutes of performance. Despite their acute increases during performance, thus while heavy fucking squats may raise your test levels, you simply won't enjoy steroid-like gains from them. The effect is not long-lasting enough. It is transient. Thus, it is not com comparable to injecting uh, exogenous testosterone and keeping your levels spiked continuously. But back to mTOR. It exists in our bodies for a purpose, and it does aid in the building of muscle tissue. So don't fear transient increases, and don't fear protein intake for your goals. Let's not exaggerate and demonize here. Uh, that is how fear-mongering starts. mTOR is important in the adaptive response that makes us bigger, stronger, and healthier as a result of exercise. But there's more to leucine influencing Richard's advice than just mTOR upregulation. Leucine also increases IGF-1 levels, or insulin-like growth factor 1. IGF-1, according to a Harvard article, may contribute to the growth of tumors. What's the matter? I have a headache. It might be a tumor. It's not a tumor. It is also a necessary hormone in our bodies during our life cycle. In fact, that same article elaborates that it is necessary for proper growth in children. But do clue into some key elements here. There is a possibility that IGF-1 contributes to the growth of tumors, but not a guarantee. Correlation exists at best. As demonstrated by the research on nurses and physicians discussed in that Harvard article. But correlation does not imply causation. Let's circle back to my previous talk of transient versus lasting effects. You see, while leucine can spike endogenous IGF-1 production, the effect is transient, temporary, and not the same as injecting exogenous IGF-1, which would cause levels to remain in a consistently raised state. What I would like to see, either from future research or anything existing, which I may not have reviewed yet, is how much protein or leucine specifically is required to raise either mTOR and IGF-1 with any significance, the key word there being significance. Moreover, how much is required within a specific time frame for that increase to put one into the at-risk range for cancerous growth, proliferation, and motility. And even furthermore, how long that increase from protein intake remains within a risky range before it drops below and to baseline. Uh, and I would like to see this research on the human model, um, not the rodent model or any other subject with a differing biology. For now, I will conclude and you can take it or leave it as you see fit, that no one should fear ample protein intake for your goals, assuming that you have such goals worth considering a higher level of protein intake, say, versus the average person's recommended daily needs, uh, to recover sufficiently from muscle tissue breakdown inherent with intense weight training, for instance. Nor would I fear temporary effects on mTOR or IGF-1, both of which play beneficial roles in the human body. And there you have it. Feel free to stir up discussion in the comments below. However, I will only be personally replying over at the blog StrongerFasterVegan.com, and I will link that specific blog entry below for your convenience. I hope you all found this episode informative, and if so, please like and share it. Also, don't forget to subscribe to my channel to keep on top of the regular updates. And with that...
I bid you all farewell.